In this video, we're going to complete the work we started in part 3 of this series by synchronizing the player's movement across multiple clients. And as a result, you'll get a glimpse at a workflow that you can use to add features to your own Spatial OS multiplayer based game. My name is Charles, and this is Infallible Code, a channel designed to help you become a better game developer. If you'd like to learn more about Unity, programming, and game development, then be sure to subscribe and hit that bell icon so you'll be notified whenever a new video is made available. Let's begin by taking a quick look at the example project. It was created using the Blank Starter project and uses the Game Object Creation feature module in order to spawn a game object for the player when they connect. We've also written some custom logic that spawns a different prefab based on whether or not the worker is authoritative. Authoritative workers will be given a player prefab that has a first person player controller attached to it. And non-authoritative workers will be given a prefab that consists of nothing more than a model. The problem with this project, the one that we're going to solve in this video, is that the player's position and rotation is not synchronized across clients. We're going to have to add some logic, so the authoritative worker sends the position and rotation to all other workers that are connected to the Spatial OS server. Why don't we do that now? When it comes down to it, we're going to need to be able to read and write the transform data directly on the Unity game object. So we're going to want to write a couple of mono behaviors to do this. One for the authoritative client that has the ability to write the position and rotational data to a spatial OS component, and the other for the non-authoritative clients that can read that data and apply it to their version of the player game objects in the scene. Let's go ahead and add those to the scripts folder. I'm going to call the authoritative one write player transform and the non-authoritative one read player transform. Now the idea here is that the authoritative worker is going to write the unity transform information and then all of the non-authoritative workers are going to read the data off of that component and apply it to their version of that player's game object. But first, we'll need to define a custom spatial OS component that we can use to hold the positional and rotational data. Let's navigate to the root folder of our project, the one that contains the GDK for Unity, and then open up the project folder. From here, we'll go to schema and then create a folder that'll hold all of our future schema files. I'll call mine SpatialCraft. In here, we'll create a schema file that'll hold the definition for our custom component. I'm going to call it player transform dot schema. Schema files are files written in Spatial OS schema language that Spatial OS can compile into code we'll use in our project. Spatial OS uses schema files because it's language agnostic, which means these schema files can be compiled into any language that wants to leverage Spatial OS. Let's open this up in our code editor. Now, if you're not familiar with schema lang, then I definitely recommend either reading the documentation or checking out my video, but I'll do my best to explain each step as we go along. First, each schema file requires a package, so I'll create one and call it com.infallibleCode. The package is used if we need to import this type into another file later on, which we'll see in a second. To define our component, we need to use the component keyword, and then Pascal case to name it. Again, I'm going to call it player transform. Now, every component requires a unique ID. I'm going to use the ID 4000, and then increment from there for every component that I define later on. So the next one would be 4001. Next, we want to add two properties, one for position and one for rotation. And I'd like them to be represented by vectors, just like they are in Unity. So we can go ahead and import a vector type that's available in the GDK for Unity. Perfect. Now we can use the vector3 type for our properties. I'll call them position and rotation. You'll notice that I gave each of these properties IDs and that's just a requirement of the schema language. And that's it. We've defined our custom component and now we can switch over to Unity and compile it. Now because this project is based off of the blank starter project, I have a spatial OS menu here that provides a couple of helpful tools. The one we're interested in right now is the generate code option. When we click this, it's going to go through all of the schema files and compile them into C-sharp code. When it's done, it'll place them in this folder called generated into the source folder. And we can see that we have a com and then infallible code folder that now contains all of the files generated for the player transform component, which includes the component itself, a snapshot class, reader and writer classes, which we'll use in the model behavior, and a couple of other things that are used behind the scenes. 
So now that this has been generated, we can go ahead and add this component to the player entity template. That way, whenever an entity is generated, it'll have this component as well, and we can write and read to it in our mono behaviors. So let's switch to the code editor. If you're following along with this series or using the blank starter project, then you'll find the code that's responsible for creating the player entity template inside of the Unity Game Logic Connector class. And adding our component is as easy as calling template.addComponent and then passing in a new player transform snapshot. And we're going to give write access to the client via this client attribute variable. And the reason for that is because we want the client to determine the position and rotation of its own player game object. Now this implementation works out for this tutorial, but you may want a different implementation based on the needs of your game. For now, we're good to go and we can switch on over to the classes that will read and write to this component. So let's go ahead and open up our write player transform mono behavior and add our logic. Now we'll need access to the writer that was generated from our schema file. And we can do that by adding a private member variable called player transform writer. And I'll just call it writer. Now it's not enough to just add the member variable. We need to add a special attribute called require. And this will tell spatial OS to populate this field when the mono behavior runs. So we don't have to do anything else to gain access to this writer class. So we can quickly implement the update method and call the writers send update method, which will allow us to pass in a new update object, which should contain all the data we want to send. And that data is the transforms current position and rotation. So I'm going to go ahead and move this into its own variable. And we'll initialize those two variables. So the first one is position. Now you may think you could just call transform dot position. But the vector three type that we define in our schema file is not the same as the one that's used in Unity. It's a special class that's part of the GDK for Unity, and we can access it by calling vector3f and make sure that we're referencing the one from improbable. And then call from Unity vector, and we can pass in our Unity vector3, and that's going to convert it to improbable's version of a vector. We can do the same for rotation. So I'll say vector3f dot from unity vector, and we can just call the transform rotation dot Euler angles to get that. And believe it or not, that's all that's required for writing the transforms position and rotation to our custom component. So we can move on to reading it. Let's open up the read player transform class. We're going to go ahead and use the require attribute to get a reference to the player transform reader. And I'll just go ahead and call that reader. And just like before, we will implement the update method. And this time we'll update the transforms position using the reader's data object. And since now we're converting the improbables version of a vector to Unity's version of a vector, we will be able to call to Unity vector. And then we'll do the same thing for rotation. I'll call transform.rotation. And then I'll use quaternion's Euler method and pass in reader.data.rotation to unity vector. And that's it. Now we've read the position or rotation values from the spatial OS entity into the game objects transform. So that's all well and good in code, but now we need to switch back to Unity and add it to the player prefabs. Back in Unity, we're gonna locate the prefabs for the player in the resources folder, and then prefabs, and then Unity client, and as you'll recall, we have one player prefab to represent the authoritative workers and another to represent the non-authoritative workers. For the authoritative workers, we're going to open up the prefab and we want to add the writer. So we'll open up the scripts folder, locate the write player transform mono behavior and add it to the prefab. And that's because the authoritative worker is going to be in charge of keeping track where the player is being moved. Now, for the non-authoritative workers, we'll want to open up their prefab, which is nothing more than a simple model, and then we're going to go ahead and grab the read player transform model behavior and drag it onto that. That way, the non-authoritative representation will be able to read the values that come from the non-authoritative representation and apply it to its version of the game object, thus keeping their positions and rotations in sync. So now we're ready to test this, why don't we switch back to the scene and then build the client. To do that, we can click on Spatial OS, and then Build for Local, and then Unity Client. This is just going to build a client for us so we can run a standalone version. When that's done, I'll click Control L or Command L on Mac to run a local instance of Spatial OS. And when that's done, we can go ahead and run the development scene. 
All right, so far so good. Looks like I can move around freely. Now, let's launch a standalone client and see if the player that connects moves around our development scene. I'll click on Spatial OS and then Launch Standalone Client. When that's done, we can go ahead and click on Play. And then I'll just move out of the way real quick. And then position my camera in the development scene. And now we can move around. Look at that. Looks like the game object is synchronizing as expected. Beautiful. So now our player game objects are synchronized across all clients. And we got a sneak peek at the workflow that we'll be using to implement our own game mechanics, which we'll be doing in the next video using everything we've learned so far. If you enjoyed this video, then please leave a like and a comment letting me know what you thought. Thanks for watching. And as always, I'll catch you in the next video. Special shout out to Trond, Loot Pigeon, Dark Rush Photography, Justin Hurst, NZ, Sean Carey, Thomas, and Wayne Glows.